Okay. Before we look at the enzyme that catalyzes uh, nitrogen fixation from N2 to ammonia, let's look at some of the fundamentals. So for reference, we're going to start with industrial nitrogen fixation. This is known as the Haber-Bosch process. And this is used to create, uh, in order to uh, make ammonia and ammonium for fertilizers for crop fertilization. So here's the balance equation of what goes on in the Haber-Bosch process. So that uh, dinitrogen gas and uh, dihydrogen gas are combined to form ammonia gas. All right, so this is uh, this has an overall free energy uh, in the conditions of the Haber-Bosch process of negative 80 kilojoules per mole. Okay, now the conditions are very important here. Okay, so the conditions for this process are very high temperatures. So this is 400 to 650 degrees C. Uh, in addition, iron is used as a catalyst. All right, so these are to overcome high activation barriers. So this is a kinetic effect. Uh, that this helps improve the kinetics of these two things. Now, the problem with this is that uh, just by glancing at this, uh, at the balanced equation and noticing that uh, these are all gases, uh, you expect the uh, change in entropy as you go from uh, the reactants to products to decrease, which is uh, means this is entropically unfavorable, right? And what happens is then uh, as temperature increases, uh, the delta G is going to increase, so it's not going to be spontaneous anymore, right? So in order to overcome this uh, and uh, come back to spontaneity, uh, high pressure is used, so 200 to 400 atmospheres. So that's to push the equilibrium uh, back towards uh, formation of ammonia and make the delta G less than zero again so that the process is spontaneous or product favored. From here, Right, uh, we have to ask, well, why do we need to increase the temperature any, anyway? Why are the kinetics so poor? Why is the rate so poor? Uh, and so one way you can estimate the uh, activation energies, you can think about, well, N2 has a triple bond. And so the triple bond uh, you can think of as having to be broken. And that's since uh, bond breakage is in, uh, requires energy, right? Uh, this is going to take a lot of energy in order to break this. And so one way we can compare that is uh, and estimate the activation energy or just get a, uh, at least a, an idea of what the activation energy might be uh, is look at the relative uh, energies or the bond association energies for uh, a nitrogen triple bond and a nitrogen single bond. And you can see there are huge difference. Uh, difference between 945 kilojoules per mole and 159 kilojoules per mole. So that has to be, uh, that <clears throat> that needs to be broken down eventually completely. Uh, that nitrogen-nitrogen bond needs to be completely broken down um, in order to form two molecules of ammonia. So it takes quite a bit of energy to overcome that activation energy. And so the, thus for the industrial process, you need high temperature uh, and some way of lowering the activation energy. So that's industrial nitrogen fixation. And so like I said, this is going to be thermodynamically favorable. Uh, but in biological systems, of course, we can't increase uh, our temperature very high. Uh, so we're not going to have, um, have be able to overcome the activation energy the same way uh, that industrial process would. Uh, in addition, uh, the, we have a completely different problem for biological systems in that we don't really have the use of H2 uh, in order to promote this reaction thermodynamically. Uh, instead, what we have are water and protons. Right? And so the energetics completely change. So let's say we make a theoretical biological nitrogen fixation. No, this is not the uh, what is done biologically, but let's just say we made something. Uh, we, we propose a uh, pathway uh, that can use water or protons in order to, dry, uh, in order to form uh, ammonium, okay? And so if we use this balance equation, the delta G is highly positive, so not spontaneous at all, right? And very much reactant favor. And so the ther thermodynamics completely changes here. So it's not just a kinetic problem now uh, for the biological system, but it's also a thermodynamic problem. The, this is just simply 
formation of ammonia or ammonium is simply not favorable. And so if we want to look at why, uh, like I said, the problem is the lack of hydrogen. And why that's important is if we just look at the reduction potentials of the two half reactions, uh, for instance, the reduction of nitrogen uh, to ammonia and then uh, the reduction of protons to hydrogen, we see that uh, the uh, standard reduction potential is going to be 0 0.274 uh, for the reduction of nitrogen and 0 uh, for the reduction of hydrogen. Okay, so that means that the electrons, uh, this reduction will be favored, and that is going to give you a negative delta G by the Nernst equation. And so that's a favorable process uh, for, with these standard reduction potentials, okay, under these conditions. And again, that's for industrial nitrogen fixation, all right? Um, this changes under the biological situation again. Uh, first of all, uh, the reduction of nitrogen becomes much more negative under the biological system. So this is the standard biological reduction potential uh, for the reduction of nitrogen to ammonia. And so this is uh, negative 0.34 volts. So first of all, that becomes much more negative. And then on top of it, uh, the reduction potential of oxygen to water um, is 0.816. So this would actually, combining these two reactions, would actually promote the reduction of oxygen to water. And so the opposite direction, which we need, uh, is for, um, uh, is for uh, water to reduce nitrogen. So H2, as you know, is much better reductive than uh, water. Okay, so how does biology do this? Then? So how does nature do this? And so this requires uh, specialized species, uh, diazotrophs. And so they're often symbiotic. In nature, which means they uh, they can be standalone, but they also uh, tend to form these symbiotic cultures with plants, and so that's very useful because what the plants will do is provide um, energy sources to the bacteria, and in turn, the bacteria uh, provide uh, fixed nitrogen. And so, for instance, these are legumes. Um, so, uh, in particular, this is alfalfa. And these are the root nodules. So these little root nodules form where the bacteria are inside of here. And again, the plant is shuttling food uh, and energy uh, down to the bacteria. And the bacteria are exchanging uh, or returning uh, ammonia to them. And so these are, uh, these are often found in legumes uh, such as alfalfa or beans. And that's actually the, um, that's the principal that's the entire principle behind crop rotation, where you might, uh, where you'll grow uh, legumes for a season and then rotate that with other uh, plants that cannot, uh, do not have these symbiotic interactions with uh, diazotrophs. Okay, because what happens is the excess ammonia that these produce will go into the soil and now you fertilize the soil uh, using this process. So back to theoretical and biological nitrogen fixation, as we noted, this is very, thermodynamically unfavorable, so that means we're going to need uh, some sort of energy input. And of course, our energy input is ATP. And so the enzyme that catalyzes the uh, reduction of ammonia biologically to ammonia, uh, excuse me, uh, nitrogen, dinitrogen to ammonia is called nitrogenase. And here is the structure for nitrogenase that we'll discuss more um, shortly. And so you'll notice uh, a few several things different from our theoretical um, uh, from our theoretical uh, balanced equation. First, there's the energy we need. So we have ATP hydrolysis uh, that's required, and their entire per one molecule of nitrogen, 16 ATPs need to be hydrolyzed. This is a very energy intensive process, uh, as the uh, standard free energy change uh, that we're using up here would suggest. In addition, there's something a bit unexpected. Uh, instead of six electrons that are required to reduce nit dinitrogen to ammonia, the, there is a requirement for eight electrons. And so what happens here is that uh, instead of just reduction of uh, dinitrogen to uh, two molecules of ammonia, uh, there's also a reduction of two protons to dihydrogen gas that occurs during every turnover. And so that's necessitates the need for another two electrons in order to do this. 
So there are a lot of problems uh, involved with this. First of all, uh, this is a very complicated reduction problem. So eight electrons are required uh, and need to be synced to reduce uh, dinitrogen and also two protons, uh, which is a complicated process because most cofactors uh, only do one electron in it and at best two electron processes. So how does this able to do this? Uh, there's another problem that arises is if you look at the reduction potentials. So this is an electron transfer transport pathway um, for the uh, for nitrogenase. So where electrons from photosynthesis or oxidative electron transport are transferred to a protein called ferrodoxin. Uh, and so this is a one electron cycle, first of all. Uh, and so basically one electron at a time is being directed towards the reduction of nitrogen. So there are eight cycles of this occurring uh, for every molecule of nitrogen. So ferrodoxin reduces what's called the iron protein. And so this is a, um, this is a specific reductant for the, what's called the MOFI protein, which is where the active site is located in nitrogenase. And so this is the specific reductant, which transfers again, one electron at a time to the MOFI protein, which then ultimately transfers the electron to dinitrogen uh, to uh, do this um, eight electron reduction of ammonia, uh, of dinitrogen and protons to ammonia and dihydrogen gas. So in the process of this, the ATP is being hydrolyzed upon this transfer between the iron protein and the MOFI protein. And so again, eight electrons times two ATP, there's your 16 ATP that are found in the balanced equation. Uh, and then so one of the problems again is that you have these one electron shots to do this eight electron reduction. Another problem, you can see the reduction potentials for each of these proteins. Now, as you go through an electron transfer uh, transport pathway, the reduction potentials should gradually increase as you go further and further down the, the pathway. Uh, so we start at negative 420 millivolts for ferrodoxin, go to negative 300 millivolts for iron protein, but then the uh, MOFI protein uh, is only at negative 307 millivolts. And so there are actually two cofactors in there. So this suggests that the electron transfer uh, doesn't really have a preference one way or the other. And then in addition, the reduction potential for dinitrogen uh, to ammonia is negative 340 millivolts. So that's decreasing in reduction potential. Uh, so that's the puzzle uh, that we'll discuss as we continue uh, as we continue on this discussion. But we'll first need to look at a bit of the structure. Okay. So as a clue to that, uh, what happens is that the iron protein. So this is a schematic of the iron protein and the MOFI protein. And so the iron protein, one by one, transfers electrons um, to the MOFI protein by complexing with it. These electrons are ultimately shuttled to the active site where dinitrogen, uh, where dinitrogen um, reduction occurs. And ATP hydrolysis also occurs within the iron protein. Uh, and this goes through a cycle that requires conformational gating uh, in order to tune the reduction potential so that electrons transfer in the correct direction. And we'll discuss this more, but first we need to look at the structure of the iron protein and the MOFI protein before we can continue that discussion.